Welcome in, Hokies fans, to this edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. We record on Wednesday, April 27th, and this is a very special edition of the Tech Sideline Podcast. Is on episode 236. We have head baseball coach for Virginia Tech, John Chef, on set. And this episode, we'll dive into a great season so far for the baseball team. Look back at a special weekend in Boston with a game in Fenway, and look ahead to a big week with in-state rivals on the schedule for the Hokies. All that and much more coming up on episode. 236 of the Tech Sideline podcast, which starts right now. Welcome you in to episode 236 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, however you're taking it in. I want to remind you, if you are in our YouTube chat, make sure to leave a question for Coach Chef. We'll try and get to those at the middle and at the end of the show. Also on set today, David Cunningham. He's in the red shirt chair today, our managing editor here at Tech Sideline. In the fourth chair today, it is Chris Hirons making his podcast debut. He's our baseball beat writer. I'm your host, Jake Lyman. And of course, Coach Jeff across the way. Coach, thank you so much for taking a few minutes this morning. Sure. Well, I want to start at the beginning of the year for you. You said that this could be a team that could surprise some people. You compared yourselves maybe to last year's Notre Dame team who came out and and shocked the ACC. What about this team has made them so special this early in the year? Well, I I just think we keep getting a lot of contributions from a lot of different people. It's not the same guy. Um, It could be, it can be the same guy, but not necessarily always. I think a good example of it was in the Saturday game. um, Lucas Donlan, you know, was three for four, played tremendous defense. uh, Doesn't have some of the flashy numbers that some of our other guys do, but there was like a big contribution from a guy that maybe you know, doesn't have 13 home runs or something like that, but did some things in that game that really help us be successful. What about c- coming into the season? You obviously lose a lot of pitching. You yeah. you, you lose T.J. Rumfield, but right. you added a lot of guys out of the transfer portal, and you had a lot of all the guys that were, were freshmen or redshirt freshmen last year, you know, another year under their belt. Yeah. But what, what was the adjustment like coming into the season? And, and what was your message to the team, kind of just where you guys were at as a program? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know that there was a – I mean, there, there, I think there were some adjustments, like from a team perspective, because I think, you know, during COVID, you know, everyone was driven apart. So we weren't really really able to do much from a team perspective, like team building type stuff. So we tried to – change a lot of that stuff up and, and, and do things that were centered more around the group as opposed to just practicing and then getting away from each other kind of thing, you know. Um, you know, and then we, I think we added some pieces that, that, that have helped us, you know, a guy like Malinowski and, um, you know, we had some really good new players, uh, Hackenberg, Martini, to name a few. But the other part of it is that we, we have a lot of returning players, that were young or that didn't have a ton of experience, so to speak. Um, you know, from Schobel to even a guy like um, Kate Hunter, who played a fair amount as a freshman and then missed the majority of his sophomore year because of a broken hammock bone in his hand. And then he kind of got beat up a little bit in Cape Cod this summer, but he, I think he took a lot and he learned a lot from it and, he is what he is now, which is tremendous, you know. So I think there's I think you have to kind of take it like guy by guy and evaluate it. Um, I don't know that our message was a whole lot more than just we're just going to kind of go at this thing day by day and prepare, which is that's kind of what it's always been. Um, you know, talking about an end goal, so to speak, but not necessarily dwelling on it every day or just kind of just – dealing with today's practice for today's inner squad and then kind of moving on to the next day, which has been the way our season's been as far as how many, you know, the, how we've played games. Um, so I don't know that's probably like a bland answer to your question, but that's really the truth, you know. I mean, David brought up the the transfers. I mean, you got a lot of mid-major guys like Jordan Gieber from Mount St. Mary, Malinowski from Penn, yep, yep. Um, Hardigan from uh, JMU. What yep. about them and their veteran presence? How have they kind of, you know, really – 
how has their veteran presence kind of contributed to, their, to your lineup and your team? Well, I, you know, you have some guys there that that have played college baseball for a while at at, at different programs. Um, you know, a guy like Eddie's been pretty interesting to us because he he didn't really play for two years in college because of COVID in the Ivy League, but he had a really good summer. Um, in 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 for the Savannah Bananas in that league, you know, so uh, as did uh, Ryan Kennedy. So, um, yeah, I, I think their their experience and their presence have added a lot to, to our team, uh, regardless of what their role has been. Um, a guy like Gieber is, is still is still starting to come on now. You know, he's coming off of an injury, and it's it's been a gradual comeback type thing. Um, so. I, I, you know, that's kind of just the way it is a little bit in college baseball now as far as the whole grad transfer thing. I think another guy who's been really interesting for us has been Kieran Higgins, who, you know, started at Coastal Carolina, <clears throat> was teammates with Anthony Simonelli, and, you know, moved on to um, – uh, he played he played at a Division two school. Um, Shippensburg. At right? Shippensburg in Pennsylvania. And then he came to us, you know – from there, so he's been around a really good student too. He's like a three eight student getting his getting his grad degree. So, but he's gradually kind of come on to a point where now he's a pretty major factor. But it's you know I I think I think baseball is a game of patience. You know you have to be persistent, but you have to be patient too. And I think we found it's, it can be difficult for first year guys in the ACC, regardless of position, regardless of age. Uh, however, I do think that guys like Malinowski, Higgins, Gieber, just to name a few, can maybe make that jump a little quicker because they have played college baseball for for X amount of years as opposed to a true freshman in the league. Uh, we made it far enough without asking about Jack Hurley. I think he, <laughs> he's been the story of this year for, for your offense. It, obviously, you never expect somebody to be batting 420 this late in the season. But yeah. did you see with the work he put in the off season that he was ready to take a big leap in his second season? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I would say yes to that. But I, I think one of Jack's biggest um, gains has been more of a mental gain than a physical gain. I mean, he's he's always had, you know, tremendous tools as far as bat speed and foot speed and the ability to play the outfield. But I think. I think he gained a lot out of playing a lot last year uh, as far as what the failure brought him. And he had to kind of get over that hump. And now he plays with a lot more confidence. He's relaxed. Um, he's not afraid to not afraid to go deep in the count and hit with two strikes. I mean, I think some of his most successful at-bats have been with two strikes this year. So not to mention he might play the best left field that – that I've been around in over the years as far as you know as far as his defense goes. So he, he brings a lot to our team, not necessarily in just with his gaudy numbers, but with a lot of the other things as far as his dirt ball reads and obviously, you know, the defense that I mentioned. So and two of the other guys, you mentioned Kate Hunter earlier, but Tanner Schobel yeah. too. Both of those yeah. guys have, have also big been big pieces and they were both true freshmen last yeah. year. What what has their transformation been like and what have you liked about what you've seen from them so far this season that have that helped you guys succeed down the road? Well, I think in Schobel's case, I mean, he was a true freshman last year, started out playing second base, ended up playing shortstop, and then then he goes to Cape Cod and hits over three hundred, you know, for Bourne up there. So I mean, you can say whatever you want about his, you know, how quickly he's come, but, like, he's very talented. Like, he's a very good baseball player. Um, offensively, def defensively, I mean, everything he's he's accomplished, it's it's because of, of him and his, his work and how he's been pretty persistent about things. I mean, it's, it's, he, he hasn't done it with smoke and mirrors. I mean, he's done it because he's got ability. I mean, you don't, you don't have success in this league because you try hard. Everybody tries hard. But I think in his case, he tries real hard, but he's got a lot of ability too, as does a guy like Cade, who's actually in his third year here because his first year was 20. Oh, yeah. it, it was a COVID year. So, I mean, it was an 11, whatever, 11, 16-game season. But we also had Carson Taylor that year. So, Cade, it wasn't like he wasn't playing every single game. Yeah. But he did get good experience, and then he comes back last year in 21, breaks his hand. You know, goes to Cape Cod. He's he's kind of in and out of the lineup. So like his road to success has been probably a little bit more uh, difficult, so to speak, maybe than a guy like Schobel's. Um, but 
probably just as rewarding, I would say, for him. And then going back to, I mean, Jack Hurley, I mean, the dude kind of plays with his hair on fire. His yeah. helmet's flying off. He's busting out the box. He's running a, uh, in, the, in the wall in left field all the time. I mean, yeah. what, what do you like about the way he plays? Kind of like, not to compare him, you know, to, like Bryce Harper, but, you know, Bryce Harper kind of play, played the same way his first few, few years in the yeah. majors. But, I mean, Jack's kind of, you know, yeah. running all over. I mean, what do you like about the yeah. way he plays baseball? Really, yeah, intense. I never really thought of that, that comparison. Um, yeah, he's... You know, I just think he plays very like there's there's not a lot of of fear there. Mm-hmm. You know, he just kind of lets it lets it lets it roll. Whether it's offensively, defensively, you know, he, he'll get upset when he you know if he has a poor at bat and come back to the dugout and it's it's it can be entertaining at times, you know. But it's like <laughs> I don't think he really cares a whole lot about what people think or what the perception is. You know, I think he just he's got a lot of ability. He he. And I think he really enjoys playing with our group of guys, as do the majority of the guys, I think. And um, I think in a short period of time, he's seen that he has enough ability where he can have an awful lot of success um, if he just kind of relaxes and plays and, and, and doesn't worry about, you know, what's coming next or what people think. I mean, it, it really doesn't matter. He's, he's just a talented guy that goes out and does his thing. So. And then what kind of changed for him mentally over the summer? I mean, last year... Um, you know, he was kind of swinging at bad pitchers with two strikes. This year, you know, he gets down 0-2, 1-2. I mean, he's willing to battle, yeah. you know, drag out the at-bat eight, nine pitches. I mean, what kind of, yeah. uh, you know, mentally, I mean, what kind of adjustments did he kind of make over the summer and what have you liked about that? Well, I think it was a combination of him getting a lot of experience playing over the summer. But I, I, I do think that last year the experience he got playing mm-hmm. for us was, was beneficial for him. And then, <clears throat> you know, our coaching staff, Kurt Albin and, and Tyler Hansen and, and Tyson, uh, Peter Scheim have done a really good job of kind of bringing him along to a point where, you know, his strike zone discipline's better. It, it's still not probably where he would want it to be, but it's way better. He's cut his strikeouts down. I don't think he's in there trying to hit for power. I think he just tries to, um, to, to get his barrel on the ball, and he's got so much bat speed that, that the results come, you know. Um, I, I like the fact you know he's the kind of guy that can put a really good drag or push down, and then you know foul it off or get a hit on that at bat, and then come back in the next at bat and hit a ball over the mm-hmm. over the batter's eye or over the scoreboard. You know, it's like he's got that kind of that kind of skill set where you don't really know what he's going to do next. Like you don't want to miss an at bat because <laughs> it could be something crazy. You know, he could. He can look potentially poor at times against a, a breaking ball and then hit a ball in the right field seats at, at Fenway Park, you know. So it's it's it can be it can be that way, and, and it's it's more it's usually a lot more successful than it is failure, and I think that's it'll probably continue to trend in that direction. Well, let's rotate in the outfield. I want to talk about Gavin Cross a little bit. Sure. A lot of high expectations heading into the season for him and maybe being overshadowed a little bit by some of those guys we mentioned with crazy numbers like Schobel, Hunter, and Hurley. But what does he, what has he meant to your team being one of those premier players in the entire country heading into the season? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think sometimes maybe people criticize, you know, I think maybe that's not the right word. I think Gavin is scrutinized very harshly because of his past, which he created, you know, with all his success in the past. Um, I, I find Gavin as a guy that, that our team kind of leans on. Um, he's a, he's, he can be a, a source of um, comfort, so to speak. Like when things are not going so good, you want to see him come to the plate or you want the ball to be hit to him. Uh, maybe for our coaching staff too. I mean – you know, as good as our guys are, you know, and I've said this before and I'll say it, you know, like if if we need a really big at bat or if we're facing a really tough arm, you know, I want him to I want him to come to the plate. Not that I don't want other guys. I mean, <laughs> you know, Schobel is as good as there is, you know, as are some of the other guys and Hurley and, and Cade and the rest of them and, and Bittison. But, you know, I to me it seems at times, I get the feel that that Gavin is is like a source of maybe security for for our team, and and I think he's earned that. And, and it's not just about his ability, but I think it's it's probably just as much about like the person he is. Like he, he kind of just lets stuff roll off of him. He's not really high or low. Like a guy like Hurley can be, you know, 
he, he can play with a lot of emotion. Gavin's probably not that way. Um, but I think their results are pretty similar. Uh, and, and I just think Gavin gives you a lot of – he gives you a lot of quality when it matters. That, maybe that's the best thing I can say about him. Like, he makes big plays, has big at-bats when it matters. He's the kind of guy that might – maybe he can have a rough beginning to the game, but when it matters in the seventh – you know, guess who's coming up or guess who they're going to intentionally walk because they're afraid of them, you know, as they should be. So I'm just, you know, really happy for him and his success that he had last summer that he's brought into this year that he'll have in the future. I think you'll see him play for a long time. I really do. And and do you think that he's been pitched differently to this year? I mean, you have a guy who comes in with the billing of a possible top 10 pick. Do you think that you know, the billing is out on Gavin Cross, and they're saying we're not going to pitch to this guy because he can hurt us, and maybe that's why some of those other guys are getting some more pitches they can hit. Yeah, no, I think you're exactly right. I mean, that, that's 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 100%. I think he's, he's you know, he's not sneaking up on anybody. He hasn't <laughs> snuck up on anybody the whole year. and um, But I think that's also why you have a pretty good hitter hitting right behind him yeah. to protect him. And, and um, you know, I think Gavin's strike zone discipline has gotten – better as the year's going on. I think he's taking a lot more walks, um, not swinging it, not, not, not chasing so much out of the zone. And then again, if you pass on him, you're going to have, you're going to have your hands full with the next couple guys, you know, which is good. That's, that's, that's a luxury that we have and that we all enjoy watching. I think as, as the lineup progresses, Nick, Nick Bittison, I want to touch on him real quick because he's hitting leadoff for you guys. And I yeah. know he's kind of, uh, I don't want to say a utility guy, but he's a guy you can plug in kind of in anywhere. You yeah. know, he's just that, he just has that ability. Yep. And I know the last couple of years haven't been maybe his best years, but what have you liked about his mentality? Because this year, you know, he's kind of, you know, played, I guess, like a different kind of player. You've seen, we've seen different flashes from him this year that he showed in the past, but it seems like he's found his consistency this year. Yeah. Well, number one, I think he's healthy. You know, he came, he had shoulder surgery last year, missed half the year last year, and then, you know, he kind of rushed back and, and and helped us as best he could. Um, he's been he's been in college for four years. I mean, he's, he's, he's a mature guy, um, doesn't get phased a whole lot. Like I think he understands. He's he's a very talented guy, and and I think for me one of the, the bigger steps for him this year, two things defensively, um, he's shown again that he can provide a lot of different def- defensive versatility, uh, whether he's at first or right field or center field or whatever. I mean, I will say he is the most versatile defensive player I've ever coached in 30 something years because he brings you the rare guy in this league that can play center field or catch. <laughs> so just think about that for a second now. How many guys have you seen that can do that, right? And he hasn't played much of either this year, which is fine. So he's been very good in two other positions. He also might play the best right field that I've seen in a long time. And he showed that this past weekend in, in, in Boston. Um, but you know, I just think he's he's a patient hitter. Um, he doesn't allow an at bat like a, um, an unsuccessful at bat or two to encompass his whole game. He's similar to Gavin in that he can have a really good at bat in the sixth or seventh or eighth, even if he doesn't have one in the first, second, or third. Um, he has done a very good job of getting on base for us ahead of the rest of the guys that are behind him, which is kind of why we put him there in the first place. And I mean, I just, I, you know, I think he, he's a source again for our team of, I think he has been a team, like a group leader, so to speak, over the years. You know, and, and, you know, credit his personality. I think a lot of guys on our team are, are comfortable, you know, leaning on him, talking with him. Um, I think he's comfortable with our coaching staff. So, you know, he, I, there's a lot of, he brings a lot of value to our, our group, whether it's offensive, defensive. He's probably our, quickest base runner you know there's a lot of things a guy can do that maybe go unseen because of all the other guys behind him with the gaudy numbers but you know for a lot of those guys that drive in a lot of runs they're driving him in a lot (laughs) you know he he, he's the source of a lot of those rbis well and you you mentioned 
kind of that group of guys, those top six guys, all are the ones that have all the numbers and everything. Right. Are there any guys outside of those, any any guys that have surprised you or pleased you and that are doing really well that people aren't really talking about? Well, you mentioned the six. I mean, obviously, probably the seventh guy would be Demartini, who's yeah. a true freshman. He's played, I think, well beyond his, his age. Um, but, again, you're talking about a very confident guy um, and a talented talented guy there. Um, I think um, – I think Nick Halisa has given us an awful lot of uh, defensive stability over at first base. You're talking about a guy that's been through a lot in his college career, and um, he's just give, he's been a real good source for us. Um, he makes all of our infielders better when he's playing first base um, because if they throw it someplace around him, he's usually going to catch it or pick it. You know, so you know he he'd be the first guy I I think of. Um, I think Connor Hardigan is his Giving us some really strong at bats down the stretch. Um, it might have been in the Miami weekend. I don't know if I have to top of my head, but he had he had a couple big games there. We drove. He had a couple um, two out two RBI hits, whether they were doubles or singles. I just don't know off the top of my head, but I think he's gradually like trended up as the season's gone on, regardless of who we're facing. And I think again, you know, going from you know, hopping into the ACC and seeing the pitching that he's faced, sometimes it takes a little while to kind of understand what you're facing as far as spin and velocity and everything else. And I think he's done a good job of of um, complimenting the other guys in that lineup, and they've helped him as well, I think, too. You know, because sometimes when you get outside of those six guys, you're saying, okay, you know, maybe I can breathe a little bit, and then, oh, by the way, here he comes. Or here comes Martini or somebody else, and you're like, maybe I can't breathe so much, you know. So, I mean, you mentioned Carson Demartini. Um, I mean, we've talked to him a few times throughout the season. I mean, you said, you know, he had a really, really, really great spring uh, in high school last year, and then comes out kind of, you know, struggles in the the um, with the Peninsula Pilots in the Coastal Plain League, yeah. and then he says he comes in, has a really, really good fall, and then the first series, first pitch he sees, you know, it's yeah. over over the wall, yeah. and then. Um, I want to say going to the Miami series, he had hit, you know, the most home runs in the ACC um, on your team. Um, what, 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 what do you kind of like most about him? Because he, I mean, he provides a lot with his bat, but also with his glove. I mean, he's yeah. a shortstop playing third base. Yeah. I mean, I, I just think there's a lot of baseball player in him there, you know, to your point, you know, he can hit for power. He can hit for average. Um, He's a good defender. I mean, we could probably play him at several different positions um, because of his versatility. He's got enough arm to play the left side. Um, you got to realize that's a true freshman playing every day in the ACC. And it doesn't happen. Very, you know, we had a guy last year do it named Schobel, you know. So, um, you know, I, for me personally, when I look at a guy like him or Hackenberg that can really handle it as a true freshman in this league, if you look around the league, I don't think there's a ton of guys that are in their true freshman year that, that do it. You know, each team probably has a couple, a few. But to see the level those two guys are operating at, you know, I mean, I, I, there's several freshmen you could run out there. Some guys are more ready than others. Sometimes they're ready right out of the gate. Sometimes maybe midway through, sometimes by their second year. Um, but it, it's not just like playing your at, in your average college conference. You know, you're facing real arms. The game's fast. Uh, defensively, guys are getting down the line quick. So there's an adjustment, I think. And, and, and I think Martini's made that. He made it relatively quickly. And obviously, Hackenberg's made it pretty quickly, too. So yeah. I mean, how have you and your staff kind of gotten the production out of, you know, all the true freshmen? I mean, a few years ago, you go back to Gavin Cross, who hit over 300 his freshman year. Kate Hunter had a really good freshman year, obviously the COVID season. But yeah. then you had Shobo last year, and then now this year you have Demartini and Hackenberg. How, how has your staff kind of, you know, you know, gotten this production out of the true yeah. freshman year and you're out? Well, you, you're you're traditionally trying to recruit the best players. Yes. I mean, like these guys, like they're good baseball players. It's not like they're just doing it bec just because they work hard. I mean, I think they're good players that work hard, yeah. you know. Um, but I, I think as you go out and recruit players and try to build your program, you're trying to recruit the best players. And 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 uh, D. Martini is one of them. Hackenberg's one of them. Uh, Schobel and Cross were one of them. 
you know, at the, at their time. Uh, a guy like Carson Taylor a couple years ago was was a guy like that. You know, and we have a lot of good freshmen. It just you know those two guys stand out because their numbers are are so good and they're so young. But we have a, a, a several other guys that'll be really good players in this league that are kind of emerging. A guy like Christian Martin. Uh, I particularly think a guy like Tyler Dean that you know he hasn't had a ton of success just yet, but give him a little bit of time. Like that's a big time arm right there. And he just has to get, you know, you're talking about a guy that played shortstop and pitched in high school and, and played, you know, played football, probably more than he played baseball. I'm just using him as an example. And I think he'll be a really good ACC uh, baseball player. Um, so, again, guys come at different times. Like some guys are a little bit more ready than others for this league. And you just, again, you got to be persistent. You got to be, be patient. You got to be positive with them, too. So. We're going to talk a lot about Drew Hackenberg in the second half of the podcast. But before we get to our break, I want to get some questions from our subscribers on the message boards. Uh, we have one from Chris Coleman, uh, and he, <laughs> he wants to he wants to talk about defense. Uh, mm -hmm. He said, last year you guys were number 77 nationally in fielding percentage this year in the top 10. How important has, you, has your improved defense been to the success you've had this year? I think it's uh, – if you can't pitch and play defense – it doesn't matter what your offensive numbers are. So I think the combination of our our low walk issuing combined with our ability to turn the double play, um, I don't know that we make like ESPN type, you know, top 10 plays on a regular basis, but I think our defense has been steady. I think they've made the plays that they're supposed to make. I, I'll give you the, the I'll use the example again of a guy like Kalisa at first base, or even Donlin on Saturday in, in Boston. Like, those guys are making your infield better because of how they play that position. You want your first baseman to make your infielders better, not just be a guy that can hit. So that's an example. I think our outfield play has been tremendous. When, when you look at the three guys that have predominantly played the outfield for us, if the ball's up in the air for three seconds, they usually catch it. You know, whether it's Hurley or, or Bittison played as good a right field this weekend as I've seen in a long, long time. And, and, and Gavin, you know, I mean, t technically you have three center fielders playing out there. They can, they can cover a lot of ground. They yeah. normally do. They're all at least solid average to plus throwers for their position. And the one part of the defense that might be maybe our most improved is what Cade's done behind the plate. As far as handling staff, keeping the ball in front of them, um, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me as far as like num you know base runners thrown out, but that's technically probably the third part of the equation. Like his ability to receive, handle a staff, manage a staff, keep the ball in front of him. You know, I I try to use the phrase a lot of times with our guys. You know, can you take runs off the board with your defense? Because everybody. You know, you look at a stat sheet and it's, you know, how many RBIs, you know, how many extra base hits, how many home runs. That's board, that's runs you're putting on the board with your offense. But can you t can you take runs off the board with your defense? And I, I think you can look at all of the guys that have played for us defensively on a somewhat regular basis and say at, so at some point or another, they have been able to take a run or two off the board with how they played defensively. And a really improved defense. Just 27 errors this year in 37 games. Uh, Chris Coleman, thank you for that question. And Chris and Will may not be on the podcast, but we're going to get to their questions anyway. Will Stewart in the YouTube chat wants to uh, talk about the crowd uh, for the Miami series. Just how important yeah. is the fan base coming out and supporting you at English Field? And how has the atmosphere in Blacksburg compared to some of the other ACC places you've been able to play around the country? Well, that crowd, the crowd that Miami weekend was really pretty significant for us. And it's not, it's not necessarily just that our guys enjoy playing in front, which they obviously do, but it becomes a difficult environment for an opposing team to come into. That may be actually even more of an advantage for us is how people come and how vocal they are and, and all the stuff that goes on amongst our crowd as far as how it's perceived or heard by the opposing team. Um, that crowd that weekend, I mean, I've been to 11 regionals and two super regionals. That was as good a crowd as I've been around in college baseball that, you know, that, that Thursday, Friday, for sure. 
Um, as far as how it compares to other crowds in the ACC, I mean, typically when you go to places like uh, um, like Carolina or Florida State, you know, they're pretty big crowds. I would say, just quickly off the top of my head, um, but our crowd is probably just as big, but probably more vocal. Like if you go to Carolina, it's it's a nice crowd and everything, and and but you know they 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 enjoy watching the game, but you might not necessarily hear a whole lot from them, you know. And our in our case, you know, you're going to hear a lot from the people at our place, which is good. I mean, that's it's. Yeah. You know, and I go back to my years as an assistant at Louisiana Lafayette back in the early 2000s, and those people were trained. I mean, they'd bring them in on, you know, on an off day, and, and like, if you go there, they'll sing that song, Center Field, in the seventh inning stretch. So they were trained to do that. They were trained to clap with two strikes um, when, when the opposing hitter has two strikes. Our people were never really trained to do the things they do. That's that might be the most impressive things I could say about them. Like they just they just do stuff that you're saying, man. Like who's telling these people to do this? You know, as far as again, a small thing like clapping when an opposing hitter has two strikes, like that means something. Or being as vocal as they are, uh, you know, to an opposing team. Not to get into too many details, but like that. That's really it's really impressive stuff that. I got to give our people a lot of credit because you can go to a sporting event and and be vocal as a fan, but you know, they they get pretty specific at times, which which is good. It's, it's it's a good thing. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. It's it's much appreciated by us. Well, if you don't know what Coach Jeff is talking about, go to a baseball game. You'll you'll find out very quickly how vocal the crowd is sometimes. Uh, Coach, we got plenty more to get in into with you. We're going to talk a lot of pitching in the second half. Talk about Fenway and the Boston yeah, College series, sure. and then JMU and UVA coming up this week. All of that coming up in the second half of the podcast. We're going to take a quick break. Be right back with more on episode two hundred thirty six. Stay with us. Welcome you back to episode 236 of the Tech Sideline Podcast, very special edition. Coach John Sheff on set with us. I'm your host, Jake Lyman, David Cunningham, Chris Hirons also with us on the show today. 
Coach, let's get right back into it. We talked a lot about hitting in the first half, but it's really been the pitching stepping up that's helped you get out to this strong start. And Drew Hackenberg is the name that comes to mind. You talked yeah. a little bit about him in the first half, but as a freshman, being 8-0, as many walks as he has appearances, in ERA just above two, just how impressive yeah. has he been? Is this more than you expected from him in his true freshman season, I'm sure? Yeah, I mean, to say the least, it's it's probably way more, to be honest. I mean, rarely do you expect a freshman to have the success he's had in this league. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think the combination of, of him and obviously Green's been really good on, on Fridays for us. Um, you know, we've had a lot of really strong guys come out of the bullpen behind them or make, you know, I hate to use the word starts, but we, we've had a lot of guys have just really quality outings at times. I think the staff has embraced the whole idea of, of going one time through the lineup um, or more. Like, for instance, the, the outing that Weicker had out of the bullpen on Sunday was really valuable for us. Um, you know, last week in general, when you look at playing five games, four on the road, and having just different contributions come out of the bullpen, um, it was really a big you know, big part of our success rate. But, I mean, back to Drew, I think um, you know, you're talking about a guy that played for Billy Wagner in high school, you know, the former big leaguer. So, like, you know, he's comes from a very uh, athletic family with his, all his brothers having the successes that they've had. You know, one is a quarterback at Penn State, another is a catcher at Clemson, um, another as a professional soccer player. I mean, it just goes <laughs> on and on, you know, so – um, but I mean, he, you know, he's just very, very even keeled. Nothing, not a whole lot bothers a guy. But again, he's a very talented guy too. And you know, I think what Ryan Fecto uh, has done with him, he's really latched onto it. And and when you combine his mental capacity with his physical ability, you know, I think you have what you have. Um, yeah, and I mean, you know, we did. We lost a lot of arms last year in the, in the pro draft. And I think um, our pitching people have been able to piece it together pretty well thus far. And um, it is, it's, it's probably just as big a part of our success rate as our, our, our offense. Mainly because what they do is they'll limit defensive lineups and kind of hold them at bay and give our hitters a chance to figure out the opposing arm. And then they do. And then it's tough for another team to play catch up. I think from sometimes from what they have to play catch up from. You mentioned Griffin Green. He's yeah. won five straight Fridays for you guys. Yep. Putting him and Hackenberg Friday Saturday back to back that gives you two really solid arms. What's his yeah. development meant to just your ability to know? All right, we've got two solid guys on Friday and Saturday that yeah. that I know they can go five, six, seven innings, and then you know again it gives our guys time to our, our offense time to to get some runs in. What has his yeah. development specifically helped you guys this year? Well, I, I think you know Griffin's. He um, he's a an older guy. He's in his third year out of high school. So even though he's a he's a sophomore eligibility wise, but um, and I think he was around a lot of older veteran guys last year. You know, he didn't pitch a ton. He pitched a fair amount, did well, and then he goes out and has a really good summer in Cape Cod with the Brewster Whitecaps that won the Cape Cod League Championship and. Um, I've said this several times, but, you know, they get to the championship best two out of three, and he's starting game one. And I'm saying to myself, you know, that says a lot there because I'm sure they're pretty good, and I'm sure they have a lot of good arms, but they're choosing him to start game one. So, I mean, if I'm him, that gives me a pretty big vote of confidence right there. It certainly made me feel that way as a coach of a school he was coming back to. And if you know Griffin, he's very um, he's a very mature guy, pretty easy going. But when you get him out there, it's a different he's a different animal, so to speak. Like he's very competitive, um, very motivated to be successful, and I think he can he can he can weather the the weight of basically having to represent the group as a as a guy that goes out first on a weekend. I think there's a lot to say about that guy, not just. Not Griffin, I'm saying, but whoever is that person that yeah. starts the Friday game because 
not only is he kind of the face of the pitching staff, so to speak, but he's also probably the face of your team because that's the guy that an opposing team has got to get by in order to have success in the first game of the weekend. And, and I think he does a really good job of representing our program as the first guy out of the gate uh, on the mound in, in the first game of the series. So a kid's development has been quick, uh, being that he's a second year with us. It's been very rapid, but it's been much needed too. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned, I mean, obviously you had Griffin and Drew um, as your one, two. I mean, yeah. Um, but the Sunday starter has kind of been up in the air all season. I mean, you went with Okuda for the first few weeks of the year, had some success in the non-cons, kind of fell off during the ACC schedule. Yeah. And then, you know, you tried Henry Weicker, you know, um, in, in the NC State series. Yep. Doesn't work out. Has on the real bad outing of the year. And then you went with uh, Jordan Gieber mm -hmm. for Miami. Throws three solid innings, two runs yep. uh, in that third inning. And then comes out on Sunday against Boston College and, you know, shoves for yeah. four and a third, one earned run. I mean, what kind of – you know, has he kind of stabilized the Sunday starter role, or are you looking to try out other guys in that role now? Well, I, uh, Jordan had a really good fall. Like, he was one of our best arms in the fall. And, again, a very experienced guy, pitched in college for four years before he came here. Um, and his grad transfer, and, like, his stuff is very good, and he throws a ton of strikes. Um, but we had to be patient with him, you know, coming back uh, off, off the break. So – I mean, my guess is like he's had two good, two pretty good outings, uh, one against Miami at home, and then on the road against Boston College. Who actually, you know, their lineup is you know one through five is is, is pretty, pretty, pretty significant. So I mean, I think he's certainly earned the the, the opportunity to uh, go back out there. You know, um, we've been try we've tried to be as patient as we can there. I, I will tell you, like, one of the good things about our team is as good as we've played thus far is that, like, we're far from a finished product. I mean, that, you know, he is emerging. Um, Matt Siverling, the big left hand, 6'5 left handed pitcher, is coming off of surgery. He hadn't even thrown a pitch this year. And we're hoping to get him back here probably in the next two weeks, if possible. So, like, there's still a lot of things that have got to happen here. And even though we've played, 30 whatever seven games I think um, there's still a lot left to happen here uh, which is good and we look forward to it uh, I, I look forward to seeing our guys go out and play on a regular basis but knowing that we have some other people coming is is a good feeling um, because in order to go really deep into the postseason and um you know, if, I mean, obviously you got to finish the ACC here, which we plan to do, but then you have the ACC tournament after that. But to go deep into the postseason after, you know, like to play the games we're going to play going forward, uh, ACC-type level games, you're going to need a lot of uh, success. You're going to potentially need some people coming on board, guys like Gieber, a, a potentially a guy like Silverling, and you're going to need your guys to keep like trending up and getting better, not – not going downward, you know. So, I mean, we kind of feel like that's that's happening, but it's not like we're at the finish line or anything like that. So, and with Siverling being injured for the early part of this year, you've had to have some relative unknown step up in the bullpen. How pleased have you been with your relief pitching with some young guys like Brady Kurtner? Uh, we've talked about Henry Weicker a little bit, Jonah Herney. They've all had great outings and been able yeah. to help you out get off to this hot start. Yeah, I mean, that's been a big part of our success. I mean, you know, there's not a whole lot of uh, complete games in college baseball anymore because the lineups that you have to get through are, are difficult. And, you know, we've really tried to stay away from, like, from riding or from riding guys like Hackenberg and Green. You know, we try to get them out of there around, you know, now that they're, I guess, nine starts in or so, get them out, get them out of there around 100 or so so that they're not going, you know, deep, deep into games. Uh, pitch count wise so that they're somewhat fresh as the season goes on and they're getting proper rest. I mean, I think it's a mistake to, to ride guys because when you're really going to need them, you know, down the stretch in the ACC, the ACC tournament, the NCAA tournament, like you're going to need those guys to be at their best then. Uh, so it's difficult because, you know, you go out there, you, you, you know, you, you want to win every game like you're trying to win every game, you're trying to put the best matchups out there to win every game. 
at the at the other side of it, you're trying to get some young guys developed too. So there's a lot of different factors that are that are working into it here. Um, but to your point, those guys have been very good out of the bullpen in general. Weicker and Herney and Kurtner and, and Higgins and obviously Firaved, just to name a few. Um, a guy like Ryan Metz, who's he's been very good too. He's been very steady. You know, he's a steady strike thrower with a good cutter and a changeup when we need it. Again, a fifth year guy. He's been around for a while. Um, so we've again, we I just keep going back to the word contributions because we've gotten. I feel like we've gotten a lot of contributions from a lot of different people. It's not just two or three guys. It's like fifteen guys, and that's what I think has been the biggest contribution to our our whole group success in general. Well, we we talked pitching, we talked hitting, um, but I want to kind of talk about the experience this past weekend. You guys got to play a game at Fenway Park, and it's obviously bigger than you guys. You yeah. got to play for yeah. for ALS. Sure. What did that mean to you and the program, and the way you guys were able to to experience Fenway and and Boston and everything that comes with it, but also be able to still play baseball and to put on a good show for yeah. all the fans and everybody up there. What did that mean yeah. to you and the program? Well, I th- I think our you know our season like a college baseball season there's there's different stages you go through and there's there's one challenge after another after another and there are different kinds of challenges that one was a big one because you know you're you're playing in this game that you know has kind of been created for the Freddy's Foundation for all you know for all of what that is. And so you have to be obviously really respectful for that. So we tried to, you know, I tried to explain to our guys, you know, what that, what that, that benefit game really is. Um, a lot of people haven't had a lot of experience with ALS, so they don't know a whole lot about it. They know who Lou Gehrig is, you know, but they don't necessarily know what, what the disease was or is. So we touched on that. And then, you know, you win a, pretty nip and tuck Friday game which is always difficult to do in this league and then come Saturday and you walk into you know this cathedral of a baseball park you know that you've been watching on you know people watch games on TV in that park you know year week after week month after month you know and it's but you know for me at least I've watched hundreds of games in that park on TV you know and I grew up a Yankee fan in New York so I, I've never you know, I grew up basically hating the Red Sox, like every other <laughs> Yankee fan would tell you that they did, you know. Yeah. But to actually go in that park, it's it's a really – it gives you a lot of um, uh, perspective as far as – it's very unique. It's, it's so unique as far as how it's laid out, all the nooks and crannies of it. The dugouts are the smallest dugouts maybe I've been in in a long time. <laughs> um, and then they, they let – you know, to the Red Sox credit, they, they let you go out on, on the field and pictures and videos. And then, you know, you're walking in the left field fence in, in the green monster there and everybody's signing their name behind the scoreboard, which is a little bit of a Fenway tradition, which I wasn't aware of. Um, and then, oh, by the way, 35 minutes later, you have to play an ACC game that means something, <laughs> that, yeah. that matters, and you're trying to win a series, you know. So that, for me, was probably one of the bigger uh, humps to get over uh, for our group, but you know, again, I credit our guys. You know, they were able to separate it. Uh, I was especially um, impressed with how Hackenberg was to able to separate being a fan and then also then all of a sudden having to be a frontline baseball player. Because when you walk in there and you're going through that stuff, you feel like a fan, like you feel like you're taking a tour of Fenway Park, and you just happen to be put, putting your stuff in the third base dugout, and then you walk out to the field and in the left field fence and pictures and videos and everything else it's 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 the coolest thing going um but then you somehow have got to be able to separate fan from work uh and i you know i was just happy our guys were able to do that but the experience that experience the whole boston experience in general was and the weekend went about as good as it could have gone really for our, our group um outside of malinowski turning his ankle on friday and hopefully he'll be back here soon but uh it was it was very good. I mean, we used six pitchers in three days. I wouldn't have anticipated that, um, and they all did a very good job, and we felt really good coming back off of it. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned the six pitchers in three days. I mean, obviously, you three starters, and you only need 
one guy at the bullpen each day. I think uh, Fearved gets it seven outs on Friday. Yep. Uh, Higgins gets six outs, and then Waker pitches. Waker you know, the final four Waker yeah, yeah, four was, and two thirds. I mean, how yeah. kind of crucial is that for guys to get multiple, or throw multiple innings, and even you know work through the lineup multiple times? I mean, any anytime you get a reliever, for me, the most impressive relief appearances are when a guy can come in in the middle of an inning get out of it, sit down, and go back out and do it again. And Weicker did that several times. Fairved did it several, did it once. And then Higgins walks into a big league park and did what he did. So they all were very impressive in their own right. One of the best parts of that weekend were guys who didn't pitch. We were able to keep Herney out of it to, to kind of rest him. Um just as one example, and we were able to keep other guys out of it too, but that was a good thing. It was also good that no reliever had to throw, go out there twice or throw back-to-back days. Again, we talked about earlier, we talked about not riding guys, you know? So, again, getting contributions from different guys and, and keeping other guys out of it. You know, sometimes I kid guys after the game, and that's a really good job of staying out of it, you know? <laughs> And they kind of laugh about it. But it's true. Like, if, if you're trying to rest guys and keep them as fresh as possible, you're trying to keep guys out of the game at times, unless you 100% need them. And I think our ability to keep a guy like Herney out was a big part of that weekend that doesn't show up in a box score. And bullpen going to be a lot more rested for JMU tonight than they were for the first matchup with the Dukes. We'll say that coming yeah. off the, uh, <laughs> the doubleheader with 14 innings against Georgia Tech. Yeah. Uh, how excited are you for this midweek yeah. against a quality opponent yeah. and and trying to even the series with the Dukes? Yeah, well, it'll be a, it'll be a, a pretty challenging situation here today. Um, they're good, you know. They're good. We played them last time. Uh, they're probably better now, actually, if you look at their numbers. Uh, they, we, we they always play us tough. Uh, so <clears throat> I'm just looking forward to our guys getting back out on the field after taking two days off and and kind of getting back into the flow of things and, and um, using different guys. Uh, we, I think we always enjoy watching our guys go out there and compete, certainly at home. Um, so we, we look forward to it um, and are going to try as best we can to get as many guys involved so we don't and, and have success so that we don't ride too many guys and, and that we're 100% prepared for what comes beyond uh, JMU. Yeah, oh, and that's Virginia, obviously. There you go. <laughs> and it's it top twenty five matchup. You know, you're yeah. going to their place. Um, it's more, and I guess it's it's more than just you know another ACC game. It's yeah. your rival. Yeah. Um, how you can't overlook JMU, obviously, but nah. but how excited are you to to get to play UVA in a top. 11 matchup yeah. and yeah. and everything that comes with the Commonwealth clash yeah. and the rivalry in state. Yeah, there come, there's a lot that comes with it. I mean, I've been there several times, both here and then when I was at Maryland. It's, 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 a, it's a tough place to play at. You have to bring good players in there and guys that are very thick-skinned, which I think we have a lot of guys like that. I mean, you can't go to North Carolina or Notre Dame in the snow or Fenway Park and do some of the things our guys did if they weren't good enough or tough enough. So, like, I have no problem going in there with the group we have. I, I, I look forward to it. I think it's going to be awesome. Um, I think guys come to Virginia Tech to play in series like that, as well as many of the series we play. And they come to Virginia Tech to play at places like I just mentioned, you know. Uh, but, you know, this one is is – is a pretty special, pretty special weekend matchup. I think the fact that both teams are are doing well this year is not surprising, and um, it's what people I think want in college baseball in general, but certainly in this state. I think people really enjoy watching these two teams get after each other. Um, <laughs> it'll just be a challenging, you know, uh, battle, you know, throughout the weekend and. Uh, I mean, I know. I just, I, I can't really tell you. I, you know, I don't, I'm not really big into predictions or anything like that. But uh, I, I can tell you that our guys will be, will be prepared. They'll be ready, and they will, they will go out and they'll play as hard as they can possibly play. That's one thing I can, I can't guarantee a lot, but I can guarantee that. And I can also guarantee that they will not be phased 
by anything that they see there because they've seen they've seen it already. It's not like it's any different than any other place. It just happens to be within the state. I mean, obviously, a long way to go um, for the rest of the season, but yeah. I mean, obviously, the the projections for you know the baseball tournament have come out in recent weeks. I mean, what kind of and the team hasn't made the tournament or hosted since 2013 in Pete Hughes' final season. Yeah. But what would it kind of mean, you know, you you in your fifth year to host and uh, bring, you know, kind of just the tournament back to Blacksburg? Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, th- I think our ballpark is certainly equipped to do that. Our team is more than equipped to do that. Um, I mean, obviously, every college baseball team wants to play in that tournament and they want to host a regional. Just, I mean, we're we're the same way, you know. Uh, I I just don't. I think our guys have done a really good job of not getting too far ahead of it, though. I mean, we'll, we'll just focus today on on what we have to do with James Madison. You know, I think a lot of the stuff that's put out there in the media, I think it's entertaining to read. Uh, I get a kick out of reading it because I've been reading it for years at different places, you know. But I know that the most important thing is today, and if I get too far ahead or if we get too far ahead of today, then we're in trouble. So um, I think we've had success and, and, and the people are writing those things because we haven't gotten ahead of what's right in front of us. So I think for us to do that or for me to do that would be a mistake. You know, uh, I will tell you that, you know, we certainly would love to have that opportunity if it comes our way. And, um, I think we're certainly good enough for it to come our way. Um, but we still have to go out there and prove it every day, as we have been doing, I think. Before we wrap up here, Coach, uh, I want to look just down the road. Uh, the softball team also possibly hosting a regional and a super regional. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your relationship with Coach Demore and that staff and what you've seen yeah. from that team and all of their success this season so far. Yeah, I mean, they're – I mean, they're a top five program in the country. I mean, what are you going to say? You know, they're about as <laughs> successful as it gets, and they have really good players. I mean, Pete is Pete's a he's a good guy, man. Like I, like I wouldn't say like me and him don't spend a ton of ton of time together because I'm working and he's working, and we probably spent more time together during COVID because it seemed like you know usually late in the afternoon I I'd, I'd take my boys out to the golf club because that was the only thing that was really going on at that point, and here. Pete would roll out of the car with his golf bag and go out and play nine holes in, the, in a sweatsuit or something like that, you know. But he, he's just a, he's I think he's um, a really good example for for any coach because he doesn't get very up and down about anything. There's not a whole lot of uh, like there's no Jack Hurley there. There's no there's not a lot of emotion there, you know. He's about as even keeled as there is. I'm sure that he's probably that same way with his team. Um, but he's also a fierce, fierce competitive guy. And I think you can see that with his team too. And I think when you, when you couple that with how good they are and how talented they are, you can, I think you can kind of see, you know, what the, what those results have been. Um, I'm just really happy for the, for, you know, for Hokies uh, fans in general to be able to go out and experience that. And, you know, we're having success. Um, you know, basketball comes off of what they've done. I mean, you know, I mean, if, if, if you're rooting for success for your teams, I mean, I, I don't know how much happier you could be. I mean, there's a lot, obviously there's a lot of buzz, you know, about, uh, about Brent Pry coming in here. And I, you know, that's, that's a great thing too. Obviously amongst all the other people that have success from track and field to soccer, I mean, it just goes on and on. So <laughs> I'm just kind of really, I feel fortunate just to be a part of it, but, but I, I do like being around Pete. He's, he's a very, uh, I, I think he provides a good example for a lot of our coaches to kind of follow. And, and it's not like he's out there beating his chest or he's not all over social media. And look, he's not like a look at me guy. Yeah. There's no ego there at all. He's just, he's steady. He's consistent. And I think his team's um, productivity is, is a part is, you know, kind of shows that. Well, coach, we appreciate you taking some time with us this morning. It's been really fun to talk to you about your yeah. team's success this year. Yeah, appreciate you having uh, me. And we wish you good luck the rest of the way. Hope maybe uh, later on, maybe we get you back on, talk uh, talk about the season at, at the yeah. end.
We'd we'll, we'll, we'll like to do it for sure. All right, well, perfect. Thank you, Coach. I want to thank everybody else on set as well. David Cunningham, our managing editor, Chris Hirons, baseball beat writer in the fourth chair today. Malcolm Stewart doing his best behind the scenes and our new audio uh, gear too, hopefully for the listeners that, that showed through today. Uh, that will wrap things up here on episode 236 of the Tech Sideline podcast. We'll be back next week. Again, thank you to Coach Chef for coming on. Have a great weekend, Hokies fans. We'll see you next time.